Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeu. And on this edition, we'll be looking ahead to the UEFA Europa League final in Baku next week. I'll be joined by a very special guest. My guest this week is David Chidgey, a.k.a. Stanford Chidge, host of the Chelsea Fancast, radio presenter extraordinaire, and of course, friend. <laughs> Firstly, mate, how are you? I'm very well, mate. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Keeping busy. You know how it is. Good. And there's I plenty do. to talk about, isn't there, with this uh, this uh, Europa League final on the horizon. Um, David, I want to start off by talking about the venue of the final. And I know this has been in the <clears> news a lot. Uh, Arsenal fans have been complaining about it. I'd imagine... Uh, the Chelsea fans are feeling the same way. What are your thoughts on UEFA's decision to to host this final in Baku? Well, I mean, you know, ultimately, you know, UEFA had no idea that they were going to get two London clubs in the Europa final. But that that's kind of not the point, is it? Because, you know, even if you were a French club or a Spanish club or a German club, it would be really hard to get to Baku, which is, I mean, you know, there's an argument to say it's not even in bloody Europe, you know, in Azerbaijan. So, I mean, I don't think you could find uh, a more inappropriate uh, location in terms of the difficulty in getting there and the expense. And I think that's what grinds most supporters' gears that I know. You know, they have to take a lot of time off work to get out there. Um, It's really expensive to get that out there, irrespective of the fact that uh, travel companies, airlines and hotels will hike the prices in full expectation that loads of fans will go out there. So it's it's just, a, it's a terrible, terrible place to have it from our point of view. Absolutely. I mean, David, are you going out there yourself or? Well, I mean, you know, no, basically, because I just can't can't afford to take the time off work and I can't afford to get out there because of the expense of it. So I'm, I'm priced out uh, and I know you know, a lot, a lot more kind of more even loyal fans than me, you know, guys that have done every uh, European away trip, for example, let alone all the home and aways here. They're bailing out because it's just too difficult to get to. They can't afford to take the time off work. They can't afford the airfare or the hiked up ho- hotel prices. So it's affecting a lot of supporters. But there are there are supporters going out there. I mean, it's not like, it. you know, there's nobody going. But it, I think the point is, is that you and I both know we've been in this game long enough if you if your club gets to a European final, you will do whatever it takes to get there. Absolutely. All right. So if it was, you know, I remember what it was like in Munich, for example. You know, we had an, an official allocation of about eighteen thousand, maybe thousands more Chelsea supporters went over to Munich than that. You know, either on the hope of getting a ticket or just to be there. You know, so that's what happens. That's the mentality that we have as English fans. We just want to be there. When you've got a final in Baku, you lose all of that, and that's that's the that's the crime in this. In this, I think, absolutely. And and then you know, there's the other issue, isn't there? There's a lot of talk about the whole, um, you know, Armenians not being able to go, and there are lots of Armenian Arsenal fans, there are lots of Armenian Chelsea fans, and of course, Henrik Mkhitaryan has decided not to travel from a Chelsea perspective, and and I know you're probably a little bit pleased actually that you know we're missing a player and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, but Looking at it from the outside, as from the club that isn't affected, you, you still must look at this situation and think, how have we got to this? How is this final being allowed to be played somewhere where a player doesn't feel safe to go? Well, I mean, you know, if I, if I have a very blue tinted look at it, I'm thinking, great, that's one less to worry about. But actually, I don't think anybody's really thinking that, honestly. In all honesty, I think most supporters are looking at it from the human point of view. And it seems to be just another reason to be really pissed off that it's in Baku. Um, you know, I mean, how, I mean, I know there's been a lot of debate about it, you know, he could have chosen to go, but I mean, the reality is he doesn't want to, he doesn't, he's not going to feel safe going out there, even if it wasn't about safety, it's a point of principle. Um, so you get, again, you have to question UEFA's judgment in, in holding a, a final of a major European tournament in a country which has, which has serious diplomatic issues with other countries. Uh, and I and I mean, you know, it could be the pinnacle of his career. And I think for him to miss out purely because UEFA have got the final in Baku is, is just an appalling tragedy for him personally. And I think if you're an Arsenal fan, you're thinking, well, that means we've got one of our decent players not available. So that's just ridiculous. Absolutely. And, and you're right. You know, it's not only this, though, is it? If you look ahead in time a little bit, Baku is hosting some games in the European Championships as well. So... 
you know, they're, they're, these issues are going to be ongoing. And like you said earlier on, the travel problems are not just from London. The, it's very difficult to get there from pretty much anywhere in Europe because it's basically not in Europe. It just drives me up the wall. I, I think, you know, one exactly. I, I mean, you know, aside from the location, the expense and all of that, I mean, I'm led to believe that there are very few uh, flights, if any, from major European cities directly to Baku. Um, I also understand that uh, the airport can only deal with something like 15,000 people a day uh, going in and out, uh, which, I mean, you know, the, the stadium holds 60, is it 68,000 people yeah. or something like that? So that that tells you how inappropriate it is. I mean, if you think back to what UEFA, the decision making in terms of whether where they were going to have the locations of finals goes, they changed completely after they held the Champions League in Cardiff, when they realized that Cardiff was basically too small a city to hold a major European final in because that it just wasn't big enough to accommodate the number of people that were there flying in and out. That's That was their logic. So why have they gone totally against that and held it in somewhere like Baku? I mean, my, my suspicions, as I'm sure many people's are, that this is all about money. You know, I don't know it for a fact, so one has to say allegedly. But, you know, we know, we know that Baku... Uh, bought the, the the Grand Prix the other week. They just offered more money, so they get it. So I think there's a lot of this going on, isn't there? You know, a lot of what we call sports washing, where, you know, countries with dodgy human rights records like Azerbaijan will will get involved in things like this for a good PR bounce for them and to, and to make them look a bit more bit more clean than they really are and i think a lot a lot of the issue with this is money at the end of the day it normally is isn't it harry when it comes to football absolutely and and i, I read something last week and someone mentioned it actually on our football uh, fans phone in last weekend that you know it azerbaijan supplies one fifth of the world's oil or something like that so you know there's definitely money there and, and it looks as though they're trying to build up the reputation of the city and you know i think Whilst on the one hand they're doing that in the sense that they're bringing big sporting events there, these kind of issues like the Mkhitaryan issue are, you know, are kind of casting a shadow over it. And I think it was the Azerbaijani ambassador who was on Talksport earlier on today, and he said something like, "I urge Henrik Mkhitaryan to come, and I personally guarantee his safety." Well, you can't personally guarantee safety; that's impossible. And and not only that, but he, but Harry, he shouldn't have to. Exactly. Exactly. That's the point. He shouldn't even have to try and guarantee Mkhitaryan's safety. He should be able to go with the rest of the squad and play like he would be able to in most other parts of the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think he was trying to make the point that this is Mkhitaryan's decision. And that is right. It is Mkhitaryan's decision. But, you know, if, as far as I'm concerned, if, you know, they've spoken about putting a security plan in place and presenting it to him and the club. If he still doesn't feel comfortable with that security plan, then you go back to the drawing board and you do more because it's... It's UEFA's duty to make sure that it's fair for everybody. You know, they're talking about inclusion. Well, you're excluding a player yeah. because you, you're failing to give the guarantees that are required. And it just, you know, it's, it's just not on. I mean, another sort of announcement that came out yesterday, and I know it's not been confirmed by either club uh, or the man himself, but it looks as though Petr Cech is going to rejoin Chelsea as a sporting director um, over the summer now. There are lots of Arsenal fans debating now whether he should start the final. He was, of course, in line to do so, given that he's been our Europa League goalkeeper this season and it would have been his last game, um, last professional game. Where do you stand on this? I mean, as an Arsenal fan, I don't want to see Petr Cech anywhere near the side now, knowing that he's signed to go back to Chelsea. And I know he's a good professional and et cetera, et cetera. But for me, this just doesn't sit right. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I, d I disagree. Totally, because I mean, you know, obviously I, I know Petr Cech very well in terms of the fact that he had a very long distinguished career at Chelsea. And I mean, he's a professional footballer. He gets paid to play for Arsenal at the moment. So, you know, he'll only be thinking about, uh, I mean, I, I'm presuming that uh, Emery's going to pick him. And because there's, there's another debate to be had as to whether he's the number one goalie at Arsenal and whether he should be playing or not. But yes, I agree with you. We're all led to believe that Emery's going to play him. Um you know, look, I, I can't understand why fans get their knickers in a twist about this because, you know, for example, we've got Oli Giroud, who's been playing up front for us throughout most of the Europa League campaign. He's now going to be playing against his former team. So my take on it is that he's going to be doubly motivated to stick one in the net against Arsenal because that's kind of how it works, irrespective of whether you're a professional or not, and you're going to do that anyway. So I can't see, I really can't see how, how Czech will approach the game any other way. He's a winner. 
He wants to win another medal. He's got a chance to do it, and I'm sure he'd love it if it was against Chelsea. Why wouldn't he? But the fact that he's going to be employed by them later. Well, I don't. See, I really don't see the relevance of that. And you know, up until the 29th of May, he's Arsenal. Maybe he'll be Chelsea from the 31st of May. But I mean, the two are completely different in my book. See, where you mentioned Olivier Giroud, that's obviously that's a great example. But where I would say this differs is that had Olivier Giroud come out or, or the reports come out that he was coming back to yeah. Arsenal, then it would be slightly different. And I, Olivier I take, Giroud I take, has left and, and there's not, you know, there's no, nothing no, to take, suggest he's coming back. I take your point about that. But the, the, the point I was, I wasn't making that point. The point I was making was that these guys are professional sportsmen and, you know, it, we've seen it time and time again when they come up against their former clubs, it actually motivates them to do well. And my point is, is that until Czech leaves Arsenal, he's an Arsenal player. And then you add in the fact that it's Chelsea. So he'll probably be motivated to do that. The fact that he's coming to work with us afterwards, I don't see any bearing on it at all. You know, he's not Chelsea again until he walks in the door and takes their money. Right now, he's taking Arsenal's money. <laughs> and I think this is the point. You see, we're supporters. We never, ever, ever get our noodle around this. You know, for us, it's all about emotion and attachment and loyalty and all of this. Bollocks to that. These are these are professionals. They do it because they get paid to. It's that simple. You know what? I wish I felt so cool about it. But I just, I just, just something about knowing that our goalkeeper yeah. is going to go back to Chelsea. You don't trust him, do you, mate? That's, yeah, that, that's what it is. You don't trust him. But also, Why do you trust him? I, I don't trust him because whilst <laughs> I admire... Perecek's career and I think he's been a fantastic servant to football um, not just to our two clubs I think that I don't know I, it, maybe it's partly because in my eyes Perecek is a Chelsea legend but he's yeah. not quite an Arsenal one and I, I agree think with that. that is where the distrust comes from and you as a Chelsea fan probably have more trust of him because you've had better years with Perecek so yeah, maybe that plays totally a part right. in it yeah but I mean you know I, I don't think for example by that illogical assessment because that's what it is i don't i don't think i don't think ollie Giroud's gonna go i'm playing arsenal that i'm much more of a hero there than i ever will be at chelsea so i'll just have a shit game no no that's that's a fair that's a fair <laughs> point that's a fair point <laughs> hey i'll tell you what i'll tell you what if check throws a couple in next wednesday we'll have the conversation again all right i was just gonna say that can you imagine <laughs> the reaction though if he did make a mistake yeah. Of course, well, it would be non not intentional, but could you imagine the, the reaction from the Arsenal Twitter sphere, which is already yeah, you know yeah. toxic at the best of times? Imagine if. Yeah. Well, I would obviously I would laugh a lot, you know, clearly. But uh, <laughs> but I mean, this is the trouble, isn't it? I mean, you know, goalkeepers are, are you know highly exposed in terms of making mistakes, you know, because their mistakes really cost you, don't they? I mean, if you lose the ball, you know, in somebody else's penalty box, you know, nobody remembers that. But if you let one go through your legs, then, you know, everybody remembers it. So he is in a in a pretty kind of exposed position. But I, I honestly, mate, hand on heart, even if he makes a few ricks, he, he's making them because goalkeepers make mistakes, not because he wants Chelsea to win. Fair enough. I hope you're right, mate. I hope you're right. Um, <laughs> in terms of Maurizio Sarri, and I know we spoke earlier on in the season, and I know we've been on TalkSport a couple of times together as well this season and I kind of got the impression not just from yourself but from Chelsea fans in general that the jury was still out on Maurizio Sarri having qualified for the Champions League finishing in the top four and now obviously with a chance to win a, a European trophy has he gone some way to proving himself and, and what are your feelings on him now? Well I mean yes and no I mean I think I think look there, there are there are a whole plethora of reactions we've got a whole bunch of what you can really only describe as Sari cultists, which mainly, uh, you know, proliferate on social media, um, who will do anything to defend him, seem to be more, you know, attached to Sari and this mythical bloody Sari ball football philosophy <laughs> uh, than Chelsea. You've got a lot of the older generation and, I mean, it's not exclusively older generation, but you've got a lot of the match-going supporters particularly who uh, are very anti Sarri, which I think is also to do with the fact that they feel very disconnected from the club and he's become a bit of a scapegoat for that. And then you've got some other people who are in the middle. And I'm kind of somewhere in the middle, really, because I don't really care about managers anymore. It's a pointless exercise at Chelsea getting attached to a manager because they're not there long enough. So yeah, what's the point? point. Um, but what I would say is this, you know, trying to be object as objective as I can, it's hard to grumble given that he was probably told by the club that as a minimum requirement, 
he has to get them play, you know, into the into the top four and into the Champions League next season, which he has done. Uh, usually at Chelsea, I would imagine there's a and if, you know, and if you can win us a trophy, that'll be a bonus. Yeah. Well, we got to the League Cup, and in fairness, we, did, we we were unlucky not to win that. I mean, you you could make a case that uh, we uh, we were the better side, actually, to be honest. So you know, we were unlucky perhaps not to win that. We got the Europa League final against you lot next week. You know, if we win that. You've got to be honest and say that's a successful season per se. But the thing is, is that, you know, there's a lot more to it than that. And the, and the football throughout the season has been pretty dull, to say the least. I mean, we don't like tick attacker. We don't like people passing sideways, 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 trying to walk the ball into the net, keeping possession for possession's sake. Just It's not what we, we, we like to see. We like to see, you know, physical, aggressive you know, upfront football, you know, and we like, we like to win. That's what we've grown accustomed to for the last 15 years. And you've also, uh, another side of the issue with Sarri is that he's moved a favourite player out of his position, Kante. People are really fed up with that. He's playing Hazard as a false nine a lot. People are fed up with that. He's got his, uh, you know, son of Sarri, Jorginho playing, who seems to be the, you know, again, another scapegoat for people because he's so identified with Sarri ball. Higuain, Sarri's choice. Awful player. May have been great one once upon a time, but clearly passed his sell-by date. Um, and then you've got getting thumped by City, 6-0. One of the worst defeat that Chelsea have had for 30 or 35 years, something like that. Losing to you lot uh, at the Emirates, where we got absolutely stuffed by you lot and found out. Losing to Spurs away, horrible. You know, there's been a Bournemouth, 4-0. I mean, goodness me. So there's been a lot of stuff underneath all this that has really ground a lot of Chelsea supporters' gears. And there's a general feeling by a lot of uh, quite experienced Chelsea watchers that, you know, Sarri and his methods uh, just won't work in the Premier League because he's just too intransigent and stubborn uh, will absolutely stick to what he wants to do, will not change it. And we all think that, you know, really to be successful in the Premier League, you need to be pragmatic and you need to adapt because you get found out really quickly if you don't. Yeah, some fair points, some great points. And I'd seen a lot of Sarri during his time uh, in Italy. And, and one thing I would say is his philosophy, you know, I agree with you that it's a completely clear one and you know what you're going to get and there is no there is no compromise from that. That is the Sarri way and he will continue to do that for as long as he's in charge at Chelsea. And I think you're absolutely right in the sense that in the Premier League, you need to be adaptable. Um, and I think Arsenal have maybe slightly done a little bit better this season because we've been a little bit more adaptable at times. But on the other hand, it's also cost us because we don't quite know what our system is. We don't quite know what we're trying to do from week to week. And at times that can be a little bit uh, destabilizing. So, I don't know. I think you're absolutely right. If Sari gets his, uh, you know, his Europa League title, and of course he's made the Champions League, then it's a relatively successful season. Um, you mentioned Hazard there as well, and the fact that he's played as a false number nine. Um, is this going to be his last game for the club? I know there's lots of talk about it. Nothing official yet, um, but it looks as though Eden Hazard's on his way out, doesn't it? Yeah, I reckon so, Harry. I, you know. I, I just cannot, I cannot, him. yeah, well, I think he's going to go to you, mate, that's for sure. Um, no, I mean, if he's going, he's going to Real Madrid. And I think the fact that Zinedine Zidane uh, became uh, manager of Real Madrid again uh, a few months ago pretty much sealed that deal. Because Hazard's always said that Zidane is his footballing hero and has made no uh, bones about the fact that he would like to play for him at Real Madrid. So I think given all of that, uh, I can see it happening. And also, given the fact that I think he wanted to go last summer, but, you know, Zidane got the tin tack. Maybe the club lent on him a bit. And he's, a, I mean, Hazard's an odd footballer. I mean, for for the talent that he has, uh, he has he has an ego, clearly, but not like a Cristiano Ronaldo. You know, it's not all about him. He's, you know, always been very settled in Cobham. He likes He likes London. His family is settled here. You know, he likes Chelsea. He likes being a big fish in a, in a, in a small pond, if you like. Um, so, you know, he's not the kind of player that would, would throw his toys out the pram and rock the boat. But I do think he wants to go. And and frankly, you know, if a player doesn't want to be there anymore, you need to let him go. And, and the other thing, H, is that, I mean, frankly, he's a fantastic player. He's one of the best. I mean, he's probably the most skillful player I've ever seen play at Chelsea. And that, that's a big claim. But 
I, I, I'd, I'd put him that highly. Um, so, and we knew that when he came to us, you know, he was the most, he was like the, the Mbappe of his day, although he hadn't really proved it at a big club. Um, and he's been with us for seven years. He's won everything but the Champions League. Um, and I think, you know, given that, he's been there longer than I thought we would see him, given his talent. And I think most Chelsea supporters are, are, are sad that he's going to go, but are, are, are OK with it and understand it and say, well, you know, fair enough, mate. You've done all right for us. And, you you know, fair enough. Go go to Real Madrid. You deserve it in a sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. David, in a week's time, exactly at the time of recording, mm. we'll be getting ready for this Europa League final. How do you see it going? Well, that's a very good question. Um, this is the problem, Harry. I mean, I have no idea because this is Chelsea under Sarri. So Lord knows. I mean, he, he who knows who he's going to... I mean, you know, on the one hand, you can be absolutely 100% uh, predict who he's going to play. On the other hand, you never know. Um, will he have them up for it? Will they come out with the right intensity in the first 20 minutes? Uh, will Arsenal just, or, or Emery more to the point, outwit him tactically like they did at the Emirates? I mean, this is the trouble. You just don't know. There's no certainty or confidence or predictability about Chelsea this season. And, and it does my nut in to say that, but that's so true. Um, you know, Chelsea are capable on their day, if they turn up, if they've got their attitude right, of beating anybody, anybody in the world. But the question is, will they? And that's what we just don't know this season. And that that's that kind of worries me a bit, you know. I think we've um, got the same issues, though. I think that, yeah. that's the problem, isn't it? That's what makes this game so difficult to call. As you mentioned, that game at the Emirates earlier on in the season. Incidentally, that was the day my son was born as well. Of and course it was. Yeah, yeah, I remember, yeah. And, you know, yeah. that was a fantastic performance. And we've seen a few of those this season. But equally, mm. we've seen some absolutely shocking performances as well. And it's really, really tough to call. I think this is probably as equal a Europa League final or a European final as we've probably seen in my lifetime anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, what I will say is that you may have the edge in terms of the fact that, you know, you need this, you need to win this to get in the Champions League, which of course is very important. On the other hand, the fact that it might well be Hazard's last game and he usually gives you a pretty torrid time, you know, that could be an edge for us. Uh, but it's I think it's really it's very it's too close to cool in a way. I'll tell you one thing, though, mate. I cannot think of anything really more awful than losing a European final to you lot. You know, <laughs> I mean, not not you lot specifically, but to an English club, let's say. But I mean, yeah, you lot would be pretty bad. Let's be honest. I'd I mean, I'd rather I, you lose know, it to you than Spurs, mate, any day. <laughs> well, that's kind of what I'm thinking. You know, there, there would be worse examples, but it's it's up there. You know, I mean, I remember, of course, losing to United in a Champions League final. It's horrible losing to another English team in a European final. You just don't want it. So, you know, I really want to win this for that obvious reason. So uh, if we lose it, I shall be very, very, very upset. There you go. Yeah, I mean, and if we were to win it, I'd be over the moon for a few days. Of course you would. I'd have that thing on my mind. What if Spurs go on and win the Champions League? It would just completely overshadow what we've done. And I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, people, that. yeah. Well, no, people have been saying much the same thing with us as well. I mean, the, the thought of Spurs, I mean, the thought of Spurs being in a Champions League final makes me want to be sick. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, the thought of them winning. I mean, we've had the double whammy this year because we, um, we don't like Liverpool much either. And, uh, you know, the thought of them winning the league was just unbearable. Thank God City managed to scrape through. But now you've got Liverpool versus Spurs in a Champions League final, so it's like Hobson's choice. Who do you, who do you, you know, choose? It, for us, it's very simple. Anybody but Tottenham. We just cannot have Tottenham winning the Champions League. The world will end if that happens. I would happily give Liverpool a six Champions League title to go and whine on about like they do than have Tottenham <laughs> win it. That'd be awful. Well, that's something that we definitely agree on. Indeed. David. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me again. Really, Pleasure, really mate, as always. It. And thanks for your insight into Chelsea. Hopefully our listeners will get a little bit of insight into what's going on over there as well and how you guys are feeling about things too. And uh, may the best team win. Indeed, Harry. Have a good one, mate, and I'll catch up with you soon. Thanks a lot. That was the brilliant David Chigi. If you want to follow him on Twitter, it's at Stamford Chidge. I'll leave it in the description below. That brings us to the end of this episode we'll be back on thursday night with our fans phoning uh, so until then guys take care bye bye